This morning's reading is from Matthew 13, 53 through 14, 12. And when Jesus had finished these parables, he went away from there. And coming to his hometown, he taught them in their synagogue, so that they were astonished and said, Where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this, carpent this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And are not all his sisters with us? Where did this man get all of these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in his own household. And he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus. And he said to his servants, this is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead. And that is why this miraculous power is at work at him. For Herod had seized John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. And though he wanted to put him to death, he feared the people because he, they held him to be a prophet. But when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before the company and pleased Herod so that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. Prompted by her mother, she said, give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. And the king was sorry. But because of his oaths and his guests, he commanded it to be given. He sent and had John beheaded in the prison and his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl and she brought it to her mother. And his disciples came and took the body and buried it. And they went and told Jesus. God's word for God's people. You guys can have a seat. It's a fun story, right? Welcome to church. Um, today we have two stories that we're covering that are very different, with very different characters. But these two stories are going to have one theme or one main idea. Uh, when I was in... <clears throat> Excuse me. When I was in high school, um, I was fortunate enough that I had a, a generous uncle who um, just liked his nephews, and so he invited me and some uh, two of my brothers and cousins, um, and we got to go to a Dallas Cowboys game with him. He paid everything. And in high school, I was a diehard Cal Dallas Cowboys fan. Now I have kids, so I don't watch much NFL. That's just how it works. But we went to watch the Cowboys play in Arrowhead Stadium against the Kansas City Chiefs. No cheers, please. Um, but, so, we were diehard fans, and so we're like, okay, if we're going to go into Arrowhead, we're going to paint our faces. And so we painted our faces, we made big signs on poster boards to try to get on Fox. You know, we, we wanted to, to be seen by everyone. We had all our Cowboys gear on. A few of us, I won't say if it was me or not, actually, this was a December game, and actually went, uh, no shirts and painted our whole torsos blue. Maybe. Some, some of us did. Anyway, we were trying to make some ruckus going into the stadium, and when we were walking in, um, or walking up to Arrowhead, you just knew you were going to get a hard time, right? That's just how it is, because on one hand, Chiefs fans are jerks, right? Can I get an amen from anyone? You know, you are a little bit. But we knew, walking in there, dressed like we were, that we were going to get comments, and we did. We knew that we were going to get heckled by people as we went in, and we did. <clears throat> we didn't know that we were going to get cups of beer thrown on us inside the stadium, but we did. We also didn't know that there would be a man sitting a row behind us that would get so angry at us that he would cuss and yell at us for many minutes and actually in anger leave the game with a couple minutes left in the game because he was so upset, even though the Chiefs were winning. Now, it may have had something to do with the fact that we reminded him that even though the Chiefs were winning the game, that they were not going to make the playoffs and the Cowboys were. I don't know. I don't know if that was a Christ-like thing, but he was not happy about it. But if you paint yourself blue and you walk into Arrowhead Stadium, you are going to get rejected, right? Chief's kingdom is going to have nothing of it. It just happens. And today, our stories are about rejection. 
the guaranteed rejection that will come in this world when we identify with the kingdom of God. You see, we don't always recognize um, that following Jesus means that we're signing up to be on a team that is not the home team in this world, okay? And a lot of times, we think, well, man, when we're following Jesus, it's going to be a life of comfort and ease. Hopefully, he's going to make our lives easier. Um, and that's just not always the case, right? We want comfort and ease. We want our convictions to be shared by other people around us. We want the majority in our culture and in politics to have the same thoughts and ideas as us. We want to be in kind of the, the majority. We want this life of ease, and that's just not the case. That's not the life of a follower of Jesus. You're going to be rejected as a follower. And so as I studied and prayed over this passage, um, my kind of pastoral hope is on one hand, um, just kind of simply, that we would understand that there is rejection. Like we just need to set our expectations in a place where we understand, hey, it's not going to be a life of ease. There will be people opposed to you. Like we just need to understand that. But then from there, on a deeper level, I think my true hope is that as rejection comes, as it seems like maybe the world is winning, as it seems like Jesus and Christians in the church are maybe getting pushed more and more to the margins, my hope is that we could have this solid and bold confidence in Jesus. Because Jesus is the true king, right? That we can have a bold confidence because we are a part of a kingdom that cannot be shaken, right? And this kingdom is going to last forever and ever and ever. My hope today is that we could have hope in rejection. Now, in this story, we're going to see two specific kinds of rejection. There's the short story first, and we see a dismissive rejection. And then the second longer story, we see an aggressive rejection rejection. Okay, we're going to see dismissive and then aggressive rejection. We're going to take these one at a time and dive into the first one first. So open your Bibles if you have not already and turn to Matthew 13, and we're going to start in verse 53. <clears throat> we're going to look at dismissive rejection. Matthew 13, 53. The first couple of verses say this. And when Jesus had finished these parables, he went away from there. And coming to his hometown, he taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Now, let's remember quickly where we came from. So Jesus was doing lots of miracles in the chapters before this. Then he pauses in verse thir- or chapter 13, and he teaches them all about these parables to a mixed audience, Pharisees, onlookers, like random onlookers and, and disciples. And he's telling them, hey, some people, through these parables, he's telling them, some people are going to reject me. And some people are going to accept me. That's just the way it is. And so Jesus finishes with these parables, goes back to his hometown of Nazareth where he grew up, which uh, historians uh, assume that Nazareth has maybe about a thousand people in it. Some people say even less than that. So it is like, like small town Nebraska where you know everyone. That's the context that he's coming back to. So everyone knows him. He's coming back. He comes back to the synagogue and he starts teaching, okay? And he's teaching, presumably, about himself and telling them who he is. Hey, remember how our people, how our whole nation, our whole people group were waiting for like over a thousand years for a Messiah to come? That's me. Like, I'm the one who you've been waiting for. I'm the one who everyone has been waiting for for over a thousand years. Now, keep in mind the crowd. The people listening to him, they knew him, right? They knew what he looked like. They knew what his voice sounded like. We don't have that familiarity with Jesus. They knew what his voice sounded like. They knew what he ran like as a kid through the streets of Nazareth. They knew what his laugh was like. They knew how he may not have been that attractive, kind of like it refers to in Isaiah. They they knew the ins and outs. They were utterly familiar with Jesus. Now, and on one hand, uh, they were astonished because they, they knew that there were some works going on. There's something like There's this wisdom and these miracles about Jesus that were kind of odd, but at the same time, it's like, yeah, but this is the Jesus that grew up like three blocks down the street from here. This is just like that ordinary kid, right? Which is what they reflect in the next verses. 55, it says this. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not not his his mother called Mary? 
Are not his brothers, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas, are not all his sisters with us? Where did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. Like, you get what they're saying, right? They're like, this is just the neighbor kid, Jesus. Like, this dude is like crazy. This cannot, he cannot be special in any way. We know him. We grew up with him. This is like the equivalent of, imagine a high school classmate of yours texts you this afternoon and they say, hey, just giving you a heads up, I'm going on a mission and I'm not only going to end the war in Ukraine, I'm going to bring about world peace this week. You'd be like, wait, you're going to do that? Like, like, you'd think, that person is probably on drugs or something. Like, that doesn't make any sense, right? This is what these people are saying about Jesus. They couldn't believe that someone so humble, so common, and so familiar could be the Savior, and so they rejected him. So how does this play out in our specific context? Well, I think it means that for some people, and for some people who have been a part of churches, who have grown up, in churches, they know the Bible stories. They could tell them just as good as you or I could. Um, they know all about Jesus. These same people that know all of this stuff are actually going to reject Jesus. And you've probably had this experience, right? I mean, I have family and friends who I have told about Jesus. I've invited people to, like, Christmas Eve and Easter gatherings and to church before. You get to an Easter gathering, like, last year, and you're like... and and the gospel is just like presented clearly, like, don't you guys get it? Like, this is good news for you. You got Daniel up there doing a spoken word. I'm like, this is fire from heaven. Like, how can you not understand what's going on? And they get done, and they're like, well, where are we doing lunch? And they just move on. You're like, wait, what just happened? Like, how did you not get this? <clears throat> People will look at Jesus. They'll observe and watch our lives. They'll even hear our words about Jesus, but in the end, they'll say, you know what? Jesus is like, he's just not a big enough deal for me. Like, I don't want anything to do with that. They're just going to be dismissive of him, and it's what happened in this story, too, and I think, honestly, I think a part of that frees us here this morning as we think about that. Like, think about it. Jesus himself, the Son of God, he was preaching sermons to people, and I imagine that he was probably a pretty good preacher, right? He probably could present the gospel pretty clearly, probably even better than us, right? He probably used verses in his gospel presentation correctly. He probably didn't pull Old Testament verses out of context like probably we do sometimes, right? Like, he was on point with everything, and he was the Son of God, and he did miracles, and all these things, and he comes right up in front of people, and he presents himself, and what do they do? Nah, not that guy. I don't want anything to do with him. I think that for us, that can actually be freeing to us, that Jesus was rejected too. His message out of his mouth was rejected too. So we should absolutely share the gospel boldly, but lots of people will just say, no thanks. I don't want, to do anything. I don't want anything to do with that. There'll be a dismissive rejection, and it's not our fault. It's not our fault failure. So you can let yourself be freed of that. And Jesus in verse 57 58 moves on <clears throat> from Nazareth to other listeners. He leaves his hometown, not because he's powerless, as some people think these verses might mean, um, but because he sees their hardness of heart. He's like, hey, I want to go to a place where people are ready to receive me. And so in a similar way, that's not a call against perseverance and praying and sharing the gospel over and over again with people that we are close to, but it is a call to, to seek out where, where soft hearts are ready to hear the gospel. And just know that this type of rejection, this dismissive rejection that comes, um, it can be frustrating, it can be disheartening at times, but it will happen. Know that it's going to happen, but know that at the same time, that doesn't mean that you're ineffective. That doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit is not working through you because King Jesus and his kingdom um, is going to move through you as you walk in faithfulness. And so take confidence in that. In the face of dismissive rejection, keep pressing forward. Now, that's the first story. 
Now there's the next story that gets a little bit more intense. It's a different kind of re rejection, a more powerful, a more emotional, more threatening kind of rejection, a rejection that I'm calling aggressive rejection. So get ready for the whiplash. The story is quite different than the first. As a matter of fact, there's some R-rated or maybe even worse details in here. I'll try to keep it church appropriate as well as I can. But here's how the story goes. It's another story of rejection starting in Matthew 14.1. An aggressive rejection. It says, at that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus, and he said to his servants, this is John the Baptist. He's been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in here. Okay, now, stop here. I want to catch up with the characters so we kind of know what's going on. So Herod the Tetrarch, first of all, Tetrarch is kind of like a governor, a ruler, but not a king. Um, and Herod... This is Herod Antipas in this story, and he is the son of Herod the Great. Herod the Great is the king who was in the Christmas story. You know the king, the king who tried to kill Jesus when he was a baby? And so there's this powerful person who's trying to, to oppress or have this aggressive rejection against Jesus at the beginning, and now skillfully halfway through the story, Matthew interjects another story of another Herod in power trying to reject Jesus. God's people. It's not Jesus this time, but it's his cousin, John the Baptist. Now, from the context, the little context that we have, we can see that John the Baptist is actually already dead when this, ha is already dead when this happens. And Herod Antipas is not a theologian. He's just superstitious. And so when he hears about Jesus doing these things, he's like, oh no. John the Baptist that was dead, now he's like raised, he's like resurrected back to life and he's doing these things. And he thinks Jesus is a resurrected John the Baptist and he's doing his prophet thing again, okay? So that's the context. Now, let's look at the rest of the story. The rest of the story is a flashback to how John the Baptist actually was killed, okay? So let's look in verse 3. For Herod Antipas had seized John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. And though he wanted to put him to death, he feared the people because they held him to be a prophet. Okay, get ready for this. Um, this is worse than a soap opera. So, Philip and Herod Antipas are brothers, and they are sons of Herod the Great. Herod the Great had ten kids. Now, Herod the Great had a daughter who had a daughter named Herodias. And Herodias and her uncle... Philip fell in love and got married, okay? That's where it starts. Now, Herod Antipas went and visited Philip one time and noticed his niece slash sister-in-law, and he falls in love with her. Then, Herod Antipas divorces his wife, Herodias divorces Philip, and they get together, and now they are husband and wife, and ruling. It used to be his, well, it still is his niece, it used to be his sister-in-law, and now Herodias is Herod Antipas' wife. Kind of messed up, right? Now, John the Baptist is all about holiness and repentance, so he comes in and, and he sees Herod and he says, hey, this is not the kind of person, or this is, this is no one fit to be a king, to be the ruler over the people of Israel. So I'm going to call out. And so he calls out the incest. He calls out the divorces. All these are, are, um, are breaking the law of God from the, straight from the Old Testament. He calls out their sinful life. And because of that, Herodias was embarrassed because the people liked John the Baptist and they were hearing all about this incestuous, uh, you know, divorce-laden story. And she's like, I hate this guy. I want this guy to be gone. Herod also hated John, but listen to this. Herod was like a governor, and he wanted to rise to become king, but he had to have favor with the people. He had to have enough people who were on his side, and the people liked John, and so he was stuck between a rock and a hard place because he wanted to get rid of John, but he couldn't get rid of John because the people loved him, and he needed the support of the people. Pretty twisted, right? Let's see what happens next. Verse 6. But when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before the company and pleased Herod, so that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. Prompted by her mother, she said, give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. Now, I don't need to explain this much, but 
the daughter of Herodias comes into Herod on a birthday celebration. So this girl is his niece and his grand niece and his daughter-in-law, and people assume she's maybe 14 years old, and she pleases Herod. I'll let you connect the dots. You probably can understand what might be going on. Herod Antipas is drunk, and he's wowed by this young girl, and because of that, in a moment of weakness, or maybe his life is weakness, right? He he says, hey, I'll do whatever you want, and her mom says, give me John the Baptist's head on a platter. Verse 9 says, and the king was sorry, but because of his oath and, <clears throat> and his guests, he commanded it to be given. He sent and had John beheaded in prison. And his head was brought on the platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother. John, for the sake of speaking out for the kingdom of God, against the kingdom of this world, experiences aggressive rejection to the tune of being beheaded. Matthew, in this passage, is skillfully showing us the difference between the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of God and what sometimes happens when the kingdom of the world tries to flex its muscle. What runs the kingdom of the world is the same thing that has always run it for all years and centuries past. It's money, it's sex, it's power, it's fame. It always runs the kingdom of this world. Think back to the Old Testament, like the nation of Babylon, run on money and sex and fame and power, right? The Roman Empire in Jesus' day, run on power with fame and sex and money all thrown in there. Think about the kingdoms of our day. Hmm. Yeah, power, money, sex, and fame, right? What Matthew is doing us, with, what Matthew is doing is he is giving us a picture of the world as we know it in this passage. I mean, have you followed scandals and politics that have happened or just in, amongst celebrities? Aren't those the things that it's all about? It's all about power, right? And money and fame and sex. This is how the kingdom of the world runs. The kingdom of God and John the Baptist run a different way. And you see a clash of the kingdoms in this story. If the kingdom of the world is sexually immoral, the kingdom of God is holy and righteous. If the kingdom of the world is power hungry, the kingdom of God is humble and servant hearted. If the kingdom of this world operates on fear, the kingdom of God operates on boldness. And when these kingdoms come clashing into each other, aggressive rejection happens. And you see this in all sorts of ways, from all sorts of different powers. As I was researching uh, this sermon, I was reminded of the story back in 2015 where ISIS, a, a, a evil a group of people, run on on power, right? Back in 2015, they captured, I believe it was um, 20-some Egyptian Christians, and in Libya, you, there was a video, right? Maybe you remember the picture. They beheaded 21 of them. This is aggressive rejection. Uh, something personally that I've seen with my own eyes years ago on one of the trips that I got to take um, to China, I got a sense of kind of the aggressive rejection of a powerful government that wanted to squash out any form of, of this kingdom power that was happening. I remember um, a few of us took a van ride a couple hours outside of one of their major cities and, and got to this compound. It was this dusty compound, no running water there, no amenities. There was some electricity in some of these places. And as we walk in, um, we meet up with a teacher and 10 college students who are doing this discipleship program. And they're uh, kind of flying under the radar in this program. And because of the aggressive rejection and hostility from the government of trying to squash what they were doing, they would live in a place for two months and they would move along so they wouldn't get noticed by anyone who would drive by or would see them maybe walking to, to buy a few necessities. This is 
um, the same kind of storyline. But the beautiful thing about these people is they weren't retorting with power against their powerful government. What they were doing is they were digging their hearts into the Word. They were studying the Bible. They were worshiping together. We got to hang out with these students and see them clinging to their King Jesus in the face of aggressive rejection. Now, for us in our country, we don't have that level of threat right now, but there is an aggressive rejection of the values of the kingdom, and I want to call us to not fear, but to have hope and to cling to our true king, to align with our true kingdom, uh, the, the true kingdom of Jesus in this. So, I don't know how you've experienced the United States in the last couple of years, but, but as you look, it feels like um, the kingdom and the church and the values of the church are getting pushed more and more to the margins, right? Then you think of kingdom values like life, like valuing individuals, and then you see that there is legislation and massive support for um, taking the lives of unborn babies, right? Hundreds of thousands in a single year. And those are just the ones that are reported. And you're like, man, this is just an onslaught of power against this stuff. And you might notice, because it's impossible to miss, um, this progressive, excuse me, this progressive vision of gender and sexuality that is just like this, onslaught that's coming from every angle in, in, you know, art, in music, in movies. It's coming in legislation, right? It's coming in the form of sex ed curriculum coming into schools. And you think of those things like, man, it's just coming and the, the values of, of the kingdom are getting pushed more and more to the fringe, to the margin. And you look around and you see, man, there's young people who are now abandoning the church when they're when they're maybe growing up to be college students and young adults, and you might be tempted to believe, man, is this thing like, is it getting squashed? Like, is there hope for the church? <clears throat> maybe um, you've actually, in the midst of this opposition of this rejection, you've actually took a chance to stand up against something. Maybe you've spoken out, kind of like John the Baptist, you've spoken out against abortion and you've realized, wow, this is not just one person's opinion coming against me. It's a massive backlash. There's a power behind it. There's a kingdom behind it that is pushing this toward you. Uh, I remember um, uh, a little over a year ago, um, someone who lives in my house, who I won't name, but she may be married to me, but I want to keep her identity secret. Um, I remember her, I remember her um, when some of the new um, gender and sexuality curriculum was talking about being coming into our public schools in our city. Her um, standing up on social media, which is a risk, right, against some of this stuff in it was not just someone wanted to dialogue about it or someone wanted to, you know, um, oppose it a little bit. There was an aggressive backlash. There is a power behind it. There's a kingdom behind these things being pushed. There's an aggressive rejection of these things. Um, maybe you've stood up against a racism before and you experience the aggressive rejection that comes with that. It may not be the same aggr- or the same people as the aggressive rejection from the anti or from the abortion crowd, but there is a power behind that rejection that comes. Now, here's the thing. As we feel this onslaught as as Christians, as there's is it feels like we're maybe being pushed to the margins, uh, could I challenge us Because a strong urge inside of us will tell us that when we're being pushed out by power, we need to grasp for power. So if a political party or a political candidate or someone in power is pushing us out, we're going to go the other direction and try to grab onto another political party. A president, a candidate, 
of some sort. But just like John the Baptist and just like Jesus, we don't align with the values of a mere political party. We align with the values of the kingdom of God. We have our values of life and dignity and God's vision of sexuality um, because we align with the kingdom and we as people of the kingdom and as Providence Church, we align with King Jesus, amen? We always align with King Jesus and his kingdom and that's going to equal rejection, aggressive rejection at times. And I think a posture that, that we can take is maybe, I, I just got this picture in my mind yesterday of, um, uh, I don't know if any of you saw the picture uh, or the video of Ukrainian believers who were underground um, singing worship songs. And you have this power-hungry leader in Putin who is coming and literally taking lives and attacking. This is a military attack, right? And in the middle of this, the Ukrainians have a brave president, but they're underground, not clinging to their president and not singing praises to their president. They're singing praises to their king, right? And so in a spiritual sense, I think that's what we're being called to. While there is a war coming for us, um, we don't cling to any powers of this world, but we cling fervently to Jesus, right? <clears throat> if uh, this morning you're tempted to lose hope, if it feels like, um, in your perspective, it feels like the church is getting pushed to the margins, soon to be squashed, if you have this fear that there's a, a secular worldview that's going to take over uh, the church and, and like it's coming to a, a crashing halt, um, know, first of all, that that comes with the territory of aligning with Jesus. There will be rejection, but know this. Rejection in the kingdom has a favorable ending. Just as you see Jesus... Uh, being attempted or an attempt being made on his life as he was uh, a baby. Then you see exactly halfway through the story, Matthew is doing this on purpose, exactly halfway through the story, um, the prophet of Jesus, the cousin of Jesus, being uh, attacked and beheaded by the powers. And we know this is a foretaste or a forerunner of the fact that at the end of the story of Matthew, there is a rejection and a death coming for Jesus at the end of Matthew's story. But his rejection and death is not the end of the story. Because about a year after this John the Baptist beheading took place, Jesus would be rejected and he would be killed by a kingdom of this world. But three days later, he would come back to life. And he would raise victorious, defeating the ultimate powers of sin and Satan and death. Amen? So Herod, in verse 2, he says, hey, John the Baptist is back resurrected from the dead, and it's Jesus. Well, we thought he was crazy, but he wasn't so far off because a year later in the story, Jesus would actually die, and he would come back, and he would resurrect. And this story reminds us that the resurrection of Jesus was the pathway to his kingship. And through rejection, he became victorious and reminds us that there is a different ending to the story, that the kingdoms of this world will crash and burn and halt, but the kingdom of God will reign forever and ever and ever. And this brings us hope because we are not fighting a losing battle when we're aligning with the kingdom. We are not aligning with a kingdom that is just going to fade away, and we are not serving a weak king. The things that maybe seem to be winning out, sex and money and power and fame, will come to a crashing halt, and there will be a day when King Jesus will put an end to all of them, and he will come as king, and his kingdom will come in full. Now, very simply, if you are tempted to look at our world with a sense of despair, could I call you to hope this morning? If you're tempted to look at our world or our nation, and you have a sense of fear about the world that our children or our grandchildren are growing up in, 
or you have a sense of fear about what the church, if the church is even going to make it another generation or two, could I challenge you to faith this morning in our king, in our kingdom? There is nothing more secure than aligning with Jesus. There is no kingdom more powerful than Jesus' kingdom, and it will go on forever and ever and ever, and that should give us hope, a bold confidence. So if you face rejection of any kind, be hopeful, because Jesus faced rejection, yet he rose victorious. And if you're in him, he will raise you up to be with him victorious as well. Church, could we have a bold confident hope in the face of rejection. Let's pray. Uh, uh, Father, we're thankful um, that you are watching over us. Uh, We're thankful that you sent your son. We're thankful that you are ushering in a kingdom that is unshakable, unstoppable. We want to take, uh, a, or we want to have a sense of hope in that. We also pray that just on a daily kind of, um, or weekly uh, sense, in the battles that we face, would you give us discernment to know when to speak and to know when to live at at peace with other people? We pray. Um, that you would give us a hope and a confidence as it feels like maybe um, who we are or who, um, who you are is getting pushed to the margins. Would we not despair? Would we not fear? But could we have hope in you? Could we have confidence in you? Jesus, make us a hope-filled, um, bold, confident people in the face of rejection. We pray this in your name. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him.